In 1897, a child was born in Waco, Texas to a poor family of sharecroppers. His name was Willie Johnson. We don't know a lot about his early life, but we do know that at five years old, his father gave him his very first instrument, a cigar box guitar. And we know that around the age of seven, his father violently beat his stepmother for sleeping with another man. In retaliation, Willie's stepmother blinded him by pouring caustic lye in his eyes. Blind Willie Johnson managed to make a living singing religious songs on the street corners, developing his voice, and in the late 20s, he even managed to get a record deal recording songs for Columbia Records until Changing Times and the Great Depression all but wiped out his audience. When he was only 45 years old, in the middle of his second marriage, his house burned down and he lost everything. With nowhere else to go, he slept in the ruins, wrapped in wet newspaper, and he died of pneumonia, forgotten and in poverty on a cold September night in 1945. 32 years later, in 1977, a team of scientists at NASA, led by Carl Sagan, were putting together a package of cultural artifacts for a probe called Voyager 1, which they were going to send into space to be the first man-made object ever to leave the solar system. The idea was that if alien life was ever to discover this probe, they would find on it a representation of life on Earth and maybe come to understand us. And the scientists debated endlessly about what to include and what to leave out, having long arguments over what kinds of sounds and data would accurately tell an extraterrestrial what it's like to be us. Alongside the music of Bach and Mozart and Stravinsky, alongside the sounds of wind and rain and Morse code and barking dogs and airplanes and the beat of a human heart, the Voyager Golden Record contains the song Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground, recorded in 1927 by Blind Willie Johnson. Willie lived a hard life. From his birth in poverty to his life during segregation to his death in homelessness, he got knocked down and got back up over and over and over again. And when he couldn't get back up anymore, we raised him up one last time, and we sent his voice into the heavens to beg the stars to understand us. So what does any of this have to do with Dark Souls? Well, put a pin in that, and we'll come back to it later. Hello, firefighters and furtive pygmies. My name is TB Sky, and welcome back to Dark Souls, sorta? We're not going to be playing the game today, but discussing it. As you may know, I finished my first playthrough a little while back, and I came to some conclusions about the story and made my choice not to link the fire, but instead lead the world of Lordran into a new age of dark. My conclusions were built on a number of factors, the order in which I tackled the bosses, the NPCs I encountered, and of course my own personal experiences and biases in politics. I have a valid reading of the game, but Dark Souls, and indeed all media to one degree or another, can support many different readings. So, to wrap up the first game in the series before moving on to Dark Souls 2, let's discuss some of those readings. Let's take some new perspectives on this game, even some perspectives that I disagree with, and see what Dark Souls looks like on the other hand. In a nihilist reading of Dark Souls, or at least a certain kind of nihilist reading of Dark Souls, because of course there's multiple different kinds of nihilism, because why wouldn't there be? But in a nihilist reading of Dark Souls, nothing that happens in the game or along the way has any inherent value. The Age of Fire has no inherent value. The Age of Dark has no inherent values. The gods, the journey, everything about the game has no inherent value except what you, the player, inject into it. And so, by the end of Dark Souls, in a nihilist reading, it really doesn't matter which ending you choose, Age of Fire, Age of Dark, they don't really mean anything on their own, but they might mean something to you. Your choice of one or the other is what matters. The thing you choose is relatively irrelevant. What matters is that you make the decision. You take control and choose the form of the world going forward because you have struggled your way 
to that position through willpower and through a drive to inject your own meaning into the world of Lord Ran. A nihilist take also lines up pretty well with the idea that both the gods of Anor Londo, specifically Guinevere, and the dark stalker Kath, who tries to set you on a different path, are lying to you. They are both trying to impose a certain set of values and morality onto your actions. They are trying to mold you into one role or another, and you, as the player, by discovering the world of Dark Souls through item descriptions, through exploration, come to define your own opinion, your own take, your own view on what the world of Lord Ran is and what it needs, separate from the ideological influences of both Anor Londo and Darkstalker Kath. One of the more famous nihilist quotes, of course, comes from Friedrich Nietzsche, God is dead and we have killed him, and that, of course, lines up pretty well with the idea that going through Dark Souls, you literally end the game by killing the functional god of the world of Lord Ren, Gwyn. Now, there is, of course, quite a bit more to nihilism than just, you know, killing god and defining your own values. Like I said, there's multiple different kinds of it, and I want to stress that I don't think Dark Souls can necessarily fully carry a nihilist reading, because by the end of the game, you will make one of two choices that are defined for you by other people. You will become the chosen undead, link the fire, and succeed Lord Gwyn, or you will become the Dark Lord. There really isn't the choice or the opportunity or the option to define for yourself what you want to do once you reach that decision point. And this is a limitation that's inherent to the medium of gaming, i.e. a nihilist, by definition, must be able to set their own terms and define their own values, but within the confines of a video game, you are always bound by a certain set of rules that you, as the player, do not define for yourself. A nihilist playthrough of Dark Souls, I think, would require you to set a goal entirely for yourself. For example, to defeat Ornstein and Smau without any weapons and without any armor and without leveling up or something like that. Then accomplish that goal and then turn the game off. Then you will have accomplished a nihilist playthrough of Dark Souls. But in completing the game as it is, in completing the narrative as it is, I don't think it can carry a nihilist interpretation. Now, I don't like Ayn Rand, and I don't like objectivism. In fact, I think it's it's morally abhorrent. Uh, I think it's awful, and I think people who believe in it should really reconsider their choices. But whether I like it or not, it is an important philosophy, and an important political philosophy, especially in the modern world. So here we go. So, according to Ayn Rand herself, who defined objectivism, my philosophy, in essence, is the concept of man as a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. In other words, there is a little bit of overlap between objectivism and nihilism, but where a nihilist believes that there is no inherent value to anything whatsoever, at least certain kinds of nihilists believe that, an objectivist believes that there is an objective reality and that value can be derived from that objective reality, but on an extremely individualistic level. As the quote goes, man as a heroic being, his own happiness is the moral purpose of his life, and productive achievement is his noblest activity, i.e., you have to live in the world, you have to do stuff, you have to make stuff, and you have to make yourself happy. These are your moral duties to the world, but beyond that you have no moral duty to anyone or anything. In practical terms, Rand often discussed her philosophy in terms of a kind of makers versus takers vision of society, where people who pursue their own happiness and lead lives of productive achievement create great things that push society forward. Whether it's great art or great productive industry or technological leaps forward, people who live heroic lives of productive achievement push society forward, and people who fail to live heroic lives of productive achievement are takers. They basically sponge or live a parasitic existence, sort of benefiting from the accomplishments of others without ever producing anything for themselves. So in the context of Dark Souls, you can construct an objectivist reading of, well, 
either ending of the game would work for it. In the ending where you link the Age of Fire, you are the ultimate embodiment of man as a heroic being. You, the chosen undead, through your productive achievement, push the entirety of society forward into a grand golden age of greatness, following in the footsteps of the great Lord Gwyn, who did the same thing before you. In the Age of Dark interpretation, it's pretty much the same thing, except you are dismantling an unjust power structure that is preventing people from living full lives of productive achievement, and that is preventing you from living a full life of productive achievement by forcing you into this hierarchical structure with the gods on top and everybody else on the bottom, and you, being the free thinker that you are, is rejecting all of those moral values that are being imposed on you from the outside, observing the world for yourself and making your own productive decision as to how it should be going forward. Either way, all the enemies, all the bosses, all the NPCs that stand in your way and try to stop you would be, in an Randian construction of society, the takers who are trying to benefit from your achievements. This can be literalized through the souls mechanic, where as you are you know, pursuing your life of productive achievement, gathering souls and resources to yourself, empowering yourself and chasing your own happiness, everything else that is trying to kill you is trying to steal those achievements from you. They're trying to take your souls away. They're trying to impede your personal progress. Now again, I deeply, deeply disagree with objectivism as a reading, but it is certainly possible to construct objectivist readings of Dark Souls, although, why would you want to? Ah, now we're more in my particular wheelhouse. Here's a reading I agree with, except socialism and communism don't actually fit very well at all with Dark Souls narrative. As we discussed previously, one of the reasons why it is possible to construct an objectivist reading of Dark Souls is that its mechanics lend itself well to this hyper-individualistic idea of the heroic, productive individual enacting their own will upon the world, but for a socialist or indeed a communist, gathering resources to yourself to empower yourself and do your own thing all the time it's not really the praxis that you're supposed to follow. You're supposed to share of your resources, to empower those in your surroundings who are the weakest and help them overcome their challenges alongside you in solidarity. In other words, you would have to find some way to share your souls and your humanity with those around you, for example, who have gone hollow, but in Dark Souls, the only option you really have with someone who's hollow is to ignore them or to kill them. In terms of the narrative, you can choose to see the act of linking the flame and restoring the Age of Fire as the ultimate act of solidarity. You reach that point as arguably the most powerful and empowered being in the entire world, and you make the choice to sacrifice all of that power, all of that strength, in order to bring the Age of Fire forward again to the benefit of everyone. But the difficulty is that in doing so, you're also preserving the power structure, the hierarchical, monarchical power structure of the gods of An Orlando, and socialism generally doesn't jive so well with absolutist monarchies, which is sort of the world you are inevitably rebuilding. Similarly, making yourself the Dark Lord and ushering in the Age of Man, you could construct that as the act of a revolutionary casting yourself essentially as a Lenin or a Mao leading the charge against the bourgeois exploiter class of the gods. But in that ending, you also make yourself the Dark Lord, which would suggest something perhaps a little bit more Stalin-like, which, you know... Uh. Fortunately, it is possible to understand Dark Souls through more than just its single-player content. Because the game does contain acts of selfless solidarity, specifically its multiplayer with summoning signs, allowing any player who wants to, to voluntarily assist others and help them, usually to win boss fights or make it through difficult areas, and without any expectation of reward from the person you're helping. Now, the game itself does reward you for doing this, of course, but crucially, you're not, you know, asking anyone else to pay you for doing this thing. You're doing it because it is rewarding to do in and of itself. 
Similarly, the system of messages that it is possible to leave for other players came in very handy for me when I was going through Seath's Crystal Caves because other players had been kind enough to leave a bunch of messages on the invisible paths that connect that place, allowing me to find my way through. If not for that help, for absolutely no reward for the players who left them, I probably would have had a lot more trouble getting through that particular area. So while it is probably not possible to complete Dark Souls the video game in a particularly socialist or communist way, it is still possible to play the game in a socialist slash semi-communist kind of way. Sharing your experience and your accumulated power and your resourcefulness with other players who need your help and assistance. And I know for a fact that there are people who play Dark Souls in this exact way, who go into the game specifically just to have fun guiding other players through or offering them assistance with difficult boss fights, which is, in its way, kind of wonderful, I think. So, changing gears a little bit, let's take a look at Dark Souls as the journey of the classical hero. Somewhat unsurprisingly, these kinds of interpretations map very well onto both the narrative and the gameplay of Dark Souls. Perhaps the most obvious parallel is the chosen undead as Prometheus, stealing fire from the gods for the benefit of mankind. Lord souls are literal flames, and the lord vessel is a literal brassiere, and you gather lord souls from the various gods of Lordran to put into that brassiere, light up the world, and then you go and you link the flame, and the age of fire returns, golden age restored, you are the great hero that made the whole thing happen. Now, the part of the Prometheus myth that's, of course, missing here is the bit where Prometheus gets tied to a rock and has his liver pecked out by eagles every single day. The chosen undead is not punished for stealing fire from the god, but entirely rewarded. So the Prometheus myth doesn't necessarily map on to Dark Souls 1 to 1, but similar stories about the theft of fire from the god all do have parallels that tie well into Dark Souls' main narrative. If we are talking about universal heroes' journeys, of course, we kind of inevitably do have to talk about Joseph Campbell. Campbell was an American professor of literature who came up with essentially a model for how hundreds if not thousands of heroes' journeys play out across all kinds of different narratives in the world over. Essentially, he sort of sought to create a grand unified theory of cultural heroes and mythologies and folklores and heroes all across the world. His model has been rightfully criticized from many different angles, but it's still one that's pretty damn foundational to a lot of storytelling and very, very influential, especially in the West. Star Wars, for example, is almost entirely structured around Campbell's monomyth. So, looking at it right here, the call to adventure in Dark Souls is, depending on how you read it, either when Asuka or Astora drops a corpse into your cell that has a key on it that allows you to escape your cell, or when you meet Asuka or Astora himself as he is dying and begs you to take over his mission. This is also when you can possibly refuse the call to action, which is also an important part of the monomyth, by saying, no, I will not hear you out, I will not carry out your mission. Supernatural aid then arrives once you have committed to the quest, that is, once you have destroyed the Asylum Demon, well, you know, a giant crow swoops in from out of nowhere and takes you to Firelink Shrine. This is also the crossing of the first threshold, where you pass from a world that you somewhat understand into the grand new unknown. From here, because Dark Souls is not an entirely linear game, it becomes a little bit more fuzzy as to exactly what maps onto which things, but it's easy to see, for example, the Road of Trials in Sen's Fortress and the meeting with the Goddess, obviously, in the meeting with Guinevere. From there, you could construe the idea of the Moment of Temptation as a chance meeting with Darkstalker Kath, who tries to tempt the player onto a different road. Atonement with the Father, well, that maps pretty well on to the idea of destroying Gwyn and either choosing to link the flame and restore the Age of Fire or become the Dark Lord. Either way, you have dealt with the ultimate power figure in the world that you have entered. 
Now, the one thing that Dark Souls doesn't have, that certainly the Campbellian view of the monomyth would require, is a return phase of the narrative, where the hero, having gone on their quest and accomplished their goals, returns to the place that they came from with new experiences and new powers that allow them to do new things. This you could construct as the idea of doing a new game plus, where you go through the entire game again, except retaining all of the powers that you obtained during your first playthrough, but that's a little bit tenuous, at least in my view. Now, I think the classic reading of the heroic journey doesn't really map on very well to a Age of Dark ending, because the Age of Dark is predicated on the idea of completely destroying the persistent social order, whereas a lot of classical heroes are much more about establishing and preserving the good order of the world as defined by the gods. Still, you could make the argument that with the chosen undead as Prometheus, stealing fire from the gods also entails stealing the age of fire from the gods, that is, refusing to link the flame and usher in a new age of fire, but instead bringing about the age of dark where man has primary power over the world and the gods themselves must fade into the background. It's a little bit tenuous, but it's certainly something that I think can be done. Dark Souls as Depression is a common interpretation, and one that, as far as I know, a lot of people have actually taken a lot of comfort from reading Dark Souls in that way, seeing their journey through the game as a parallel to their journey through depression and their victories in the game as encouragement to also savor the victories that they have against their negative mental state. And I can absolutely see this reading. The gameplay mechanics of Dark Souls emphasize persistence, perseverance, playing through your mistakes. You can't reload a save in Dark Souls. If you suffer a catastrophic defeat and lose everything, you have to move through it. You have to grind your way to victory with sheer bloody-minded persistence gaining small incremental upgrades that make you just that little bit stronger for the next fight. And you have to stand against the odds every single time and say, no, I will do this. I will make it through this. I will learn how to beat this. In this interpretation of the game, bosses and challenges within Dark Souls are like bouts of depression in real life that must be overcome, not necessarily by triumphing over them in a blaze of glory, but by never ever giving up no matter how many times they manage to knock you down. And this is accurate to the experience of dealing with depression, at least my experience of dealing with depression. It's a slow grind of just keeping on and keeping on and never letting it beat you down fully. In this interpretation of the game, of course, hollowing also makes a very compelling metaphor for depression. As we shall talk about a little bit later, people who are hollowed are essentially people who have been beaten by depression, reduced to only their most basic functions, but unable to pursue a meaningful life because depression has taken away all of their agency. The game's narrative, though, has a somewhat more difficult time supporting the idea of Dark Souls as battle with depression. You could see linking the fire as the ultimate act of perseverance against everything. You are standing against the dark, and even if your sacrifice has diminishing returns and you're going to have to have someone else come back and do it all over again later, the important thing is that you never give up, no matter how hopeless it is, no matter how impossible it seems to be to beat this relentless cycle of depression. And depression is cyclical. It tends to be something that comes in waves and comes around at certain times or with certain triggers. The way to survive and beat depression is to always, always light the fire one more time. Even if it's gonna fade again, you light it one more time. But in that interpretation, what then is the Age of Dark here? Is it surrender to the inevitable? Is it recognition that you can't beat depression and therefore, I guess, death? Or is it transcendence? Is it finally seeing the cycle for what it is and finding a way to break it and move on to something new and better? It's 
kind of unclear and a little bit difficult to map it directly onto the experience of depression. It's also kind of difficult to square the idea of, for instance, the manipulations of Frampt or Darkstalker Kath or the roles of NPCs such as Guinevere or Gwendolyn with this particular reading of the game. Depression as a lens through which to understand Dark Souls maps really well onto the mechanics of the game, but is somewhat more tenuous when it comes to the story. At the end of the Gwyn episode, when I finished my run through Dark Souls, I asked you guys to head into the comments and give me your readings of the game and its story. Now, I thought maybe I'd get a couple of dozen comments, but I got, well, I got more than that. I, I got a lot more than that. I got many. I got hundreds of comments, actually. And I, I the idea was I wanted to put these comments in this video, but there were so many... I couldn't possibly use all of them. And so many people had taken time, collectively, out of their lives to write all these comments, to expose me to all of their feelings and their thoughts about this game, and some of them really kind of bared their hearts. I wanted to do something to honor that, so I did two things. First. I collected all of the comments that people left talking about what Dark Souls means to them, and I put them all in a document. I did some basic editing for grammar and punctuation and so on, and just generally tried to make it a pleasantly readable document. That ended up being about 76 pages long and almost 34,000 words, because it turns out this game means kind of a lot to kind of a lot of people. The second thing I did was I took 15 comments that I personally liked and which seemed to represent at least a few different perspectives on the game, and I edited them together with some stills from the boss designs of Dark Souls and some concept art from the game and tried to make a vaguely artistic presentation out of them, a little magazine, if you will. For the purposes of this video, we're going to be reading through a few of the comments that I like and some of the ones that hit me the hardest. And if you'd like to read the rest of them or read the little magazine I made, both of those documents are available in the link down in the description. Take these as a kind of repository or a resource, a way to access a lot of other people's feelings and thoughts about this particular video game. It's a way for you to learn something about how so many other people have felt about this game, which to you may have been only a video game, but which to other people has been a lot more than that. Dark Souls was an echo of my core beliefs, a reflection of how I see reality. This being that the universe is uncaring. We just so happen to exist. No such thing as true or innate morality or good or evil exist. There's only existence and choices which produce results. But the presence of this void is what made me struggle through. It was comforting how I could create my own meaning through choice, much like in reality where I create my own meaning and struggle through life despite knowing everything will be lost. Lordran will succumb to the dark, like the world will in the heat death of the universe. Therefore, Dark Souls is the ultimate embodiment of have fun, and damn it, I did. To me, Dark Souls was the story of a lone human falling ever closer to hollowing. I did not want to look up anything about the game while playing, so I didn't, which left me running at Artorias with a plus five scimitar over and over and over and over again. After hours upon hours, I finally did it, only to move on and repeat the same death march against every boss I came up against. When I finally bested Gwyn and was standing at the kiln, I had already forgotten why I was there, or maybe I didn't even actually know back then, I just ran past the NPC quest lines and barely ever even stopped to talk to them. I had died so many times that the quest didn't even matter anymore, and that's when I realized that my play was starting to reflect the narrative of hollowing. I just mindlessly kept doing the thing I thought I was supposed to do not unlike the Hollows keeping watch at the undead parish. I tried quite hard to think of a nice way to round this off, but yeah, I'm no writer. Personally, the Dark Souls as depression narrative is the one that really speaks to me. Lordran is a world that is out to destroy you at every turn. Everyone in Lordran, Solaer, Sigmire, Crestfallen Knight, Laurentius, Logan, will, if you follow their quest lines, 
eventually get swallowed up by it. Depression, at least in my experience, works like that sometimes. It's out to destroy you and can consume like fire. When you're depressed and everything, even little things, can break your will to go on, going hollow feels like an apt description of that hopelessness. In short, your soul feels dark. And that's why I feel like it's worth keeping the fire lit. Keeping the fire lit becomes a personal quest rather than a save the world quest. In a world that is constantly pushing you to darkness, you fight to keep your fire alive. It's about always getting up when you're knocked down and not daring to go hollow, because in the end, keeping the light inside you alive is worth the struggle, no matter how dark things become or whether it'll all be meaningless in the end. I think there's a heroism in, like, perseverance in the face of that sort of nihilistic world that really speaks to me as someone who struggled with depression. Finding purpose in continued existence, you know? Anyway, that's not a unique take, but it's the one I like. So, Dark Souls 1 came to me at a very dire time in my life. My father was in the last few years of his life, and I was using the game as a way to cope, to somehow thrive in a world that was just as dire as the world around me. And unlike my reality, I could get strong enough to change things, to fix things, to make things better, to heal, even at the cost of myself. I did all I could, we did all we could, to keep Dad alive and well, but that just delayed things. And I realize it now, of course. As his mind and body slipped into something completely unrecognizable to the lively, jovial, gorgeous man I grew up with. Near the end, the last few days, he only recognized me, but could barely communicate in his fog. And perhaps because of that, or that I didn't know there was another option, I linked the fire the first playthrough. I felt I had to destroy myself, like I almost did falling into my own depression that I've always dealt with, to make things better for everyone else. I would. After all, my age of fire would be fine, even for a little while. Years later, I played through again. Dad was gone, and I had grown. And I turned away from the flame. So, let's end this video by returning to my opinion. Yes, the YouTuber pivots to his own particular hot take. What a surprise. But let's talk about humanity. One thing I didn't bring up in the Gwyn video when talking about why I didn't link the fire is Ula Seal. As a number of people pointed out in their comments, Ula Seal is a demonstration of what happens when humanity is allowed to run wild, an example of what happens when the dark rules the world. What a lot of people take away from that, though, is that because there isn't a clearly good ending, because Dark Souls doesn't present you with one clearly desirable outcome, that every decision you choose to make at the end is in some way flawed, that means there isn't a right decision to make. Now, I'm not going to call out anyone for thinking this because it's a valid position to take. It's just a position that I happen to strongly disagree with, and I want to push back against it a little bit. I don't think it doesn't matter whether you link the flame or go into the Age of the Dark. And this is why I told you the story of Blind Willie Johnson and the Voyager Golden Record at the start of the episode. The human condition is not all sunshine and rainbows. Suffering is part of who and what we are as a species. And a lot of suffering we inflict on each other. Blind Willie Johnson died because his house burned down and no one gave him shelter. He died because he contracted pneumonia and no one gave him health care. He died, in short, because the rest of us let him. There's a number of reasons why human beings sometimes let each other die. But in the modern world especially, one of the biggest reasons is our tendency to establish and enforce hierarchies. And here come the lefty politics! Under capitalism, we like to enforce hierarchies like, for example, the only people who deserve to have shelter are those who have enough money to pay for it, or the only people who deserve not to die of diseases are those who can pay for medicine and healthcare. 
Now, capitalism at least does theoretically allow for upward mobility in the hierarchy. In theory, you can make money and lift yourself out of poverty through work, although the clever historical scholar might notice that there has never been a time under capitalism where there wasn't a large class of people living in poverty for some reason, which, once noticed, should raise some important questions in your mind. Besides the hierarchy of money in capitalism, though, we like to enforce other kinds of hierarchies, too. Hierarchies that do not have even theoretical upward mobility. Hierarchies of nationality, sexuality, gender, race. In Dark Souls, Guinevere and Frampt try to fit you into a hierarchy the moment you meet them. You're not just an undead, no, no, you're the chosen undead, the special undead. You're not like all the other lazy undead ones who just go hollow and never put in their hard work to make the world a better place. No, you are destined for greater things, to succeed Lord Gwyn and Link the Flame. <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, Linking the Flame also preserves the power structure where the gods are on top, but hey, don't worry about that, just go kill some guys. In the Age of Fire, there is a hierarchy, with the gods up at the top and everyone else in service and subservience to them, to the point where, if the Age of Fire is ever threatened, the rest of the world is expected to willingly sacrifice itself to keep the Age of Fire going. Hell, even Gwyn sacrifices himself to keep the Age of Fire going because preserving that power structure is so important. This in the lore of Dark Souls is the fate of the undead, to sacrifice themselves in whatever number is necessary to bring the Age of Fire, the hierarchy, back. Now, I am not a lot fonder of the manipulations of Kath, who definitely has some kind of ulterior agenda in pushing me towards letting the fire die, but crucially, his argumentation, the world that he argues for, is one without the hierarchy and dominion of the gods. Even if he has ulterior motives in doing so, the vision that he's pushing me to fight for is one of a world of humans absent their domineering overlords. Now, we've discussed that humans don't necessarily always treat each other that great either, and we've discussed how you're still just re-establishing a power structure with the Dark Lord on top rather than a god, but it's at least a step in a better direction. It's a step away from at least one kind of rigid, impermeable, frozen, unchanging hierarchy. And that's what I mean when I say I want to push back against the idea of the endings as equivalent or equally flawed. I don't think they're equally flawed. I think they're flawed in different ways, and those differences matter. I think, and this is just my reading, that Dark Souls is a game that wants you to take a position on this, that wants you to commit to something, to make a decision. It doesn't want you to get to the end and be indifferent. And the reason I think so is because the only way you can win this game, the only way you get through its boss fights and places like the Lost Isolith especially, is with commitment. You have to commit to running at these bosses over and over and over again. You have to commit to learning the fights and the perfect dodge timings, or you have to commit to taking the time to power level your character and upgrade all your weapons until your equipment is completely broken and you can just tank your way through all the bosses like I did kind of a lot of the game. No matter what you choose to do, it takes time and effort, and as many people noted in the comments, hollowing in the game's story is a close metaphor or representation of the act of giving up. The game says, commit to something, believe in it. And this comes through even in the microcosm of the mechanics. When you commit to a build in Dark Souls, that's like, once you've spent those skill points, they're in there and you have to fight with whatever you have on hand. You commit to a build of a sorcerer or a strength or a, what's it called, strength, dexterity, quality build. You commit to your weapon or your fighting style or your build, and by the end of the game you have made an endless string of commitments. And so for me, getting to the end, to the most pivotal moment in the game's narrative, in a game that asks you to commit so much to its mechanics and so much to its gameplay, and a game where if you want to know what the hell is going on, you have to go find a bunch of items and read all of their descriptions. You have to commit even to know what's happening. I don't think you get to the end of that game and then, oh, which ending you pick just doesn't matter. They're the same. Who cares? It's like in Mass Effect, you pick a button and then you get a different colored explosion. 
I think the ending of Dark Souls matters. I think it matters which ending you pick, and I think it matters why. I don't necessarily mean that you have to agree with me and all of my left-wing politics in order to have a valid reading of Dark Souls, but you do have to commit to one or the other and know why you do it. Or, as at least one person have told me, they were so frustrated that there wasn't an option at the end of Dark Souls to just walk away from it all and say, screw the Age of Fire, screw the Age of Dark, I have killed Gwyn and now I'm done, that they've made it a habit when they get to the end of the game and they've beaten Gwyn, they just delete their save game. <laughs> Which again is commitment to not committing. Dark Souls wants you to take a position on its narrative, on its themes, on its lore, on its mechanics, on everything. It wants you to have an opinion of it. I refuse to link the flame because I believe in humanity, and I don't believe in divine hierarchies. I refuse to blink the flame because we humans, despite all our weaknesses and our cruelties, despite our tendency to follow the wrong ideas, to go hollow inside, we are also a species that thought that to introduce ourselves to aliens we should alongside the classical geniuses and the greetings in two dozen languages and romantic nature sounds, send them the voice of someone who we did wrong. And not as apology or compensation, the man was long dead and it's not like we fix racism even now, but as an act of recognition that for all our genius and brilliance, this is who we are too. And it is that recognition that we are flawed and that we must change. That to me is the saving grace of humanity. That is hope. The hope that there can be change for the better. But that hope exists in the dark, in the uncertain future. It's the distant star that we send voyagers towards. And we can't see it if all we're doing is crowding around the fire to watch shadows play on the wall. Hey, thank you very much for watching the last episode of anything related to Dark Souls 1 that I will ever do. I'm done now. We have finished. We're never going back. Onward to Dark Souls 2. Oh, good lord, this video took forever to edit. If you've enjoyed it, though, please feel free to hit the like, comment, and subscribe buttons, and also actually leave a comment down there and hit the bell icon and all of your YouTube stuff, because numbers going up is literally the only thing that keeps a YouTube channel alive. Well, besides maybe one other thing. Because if you want to support the channel more directly, there's a Patreon for that, where you can sign up for a monthly subscription of whatever you want, and there's some rewards and stuff over there if you feel like it. If you don't want to sign up for a monthly subscription, then I do have a couple of chip jars down in the description that you can, you know, give me three dollars and say, Hey, that's that was sure was a lot of Dark Souls. Have some dollars. You clearly need the help, man. And as I say at the end of my videos, one dollar to an online content creator can be the same as thousands of views on a video or tens of thousands of views on an ad-supported webpage and stuff like that. So those small amounts that can feel like they don't matter very much actually matter a great deal to people like me. So whether it's me or it's someone else, if there's online content creators whose work you enjoy, please consider supporting them directly with literally anything you can spare. It matters a lot more than you think. Anyway, if you haven't enjoyed this video, well, then there is a particular reading of YouTube that suggests that the correct solution to that problem might be to hit the dislike button, but honestly, I disagree. My reading of YouTube says that you should always hit the like button. That's like, that's the true meaning of YouTube. That's really the true ending uh, that you want to be going for. And the dislike button is kind of like a false ending that doesn't really matter. Like if you're doing that, then you're doing it wrong. But like, you don't have to take my opinion. Of course, you can have your own opinion. Maybe in your reading of YouTube, the dislike button is the right thing to hit. Cause you know, we all have the right to be wrong. Thank you very much for watching.